we'll move on to Frank Swain. And Frank uh, is a science writer. He recently did a um, BBC uh, a radio show on Hack My Hearing, but I'll let Frank explain some of the ways he's going to hack sure. his hearing. Awesome. Can I just click on this? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I am a science writer. Um, <clears throat> I run a column at the moment for BBC Future entitled Beyond Human. It's through the BBC Worldwide, so you can't actually see it if you're in the UK, which is a, a bit... But you guys are all clever people, so I'm sure you'll figure out some kind of <laughs> VPN proxies in order to read it. Uh, and I've covered a couple of things here tonight, so it's uh, it's great to uh, see you again as well. Um, so yeah, why am I here today? Uh, I'm going deaf, unfortunately. Uh, that's, that's my sort of bad luck. And this has kind of been happening for a long time. I used to go to a lot of gigs and, and worked in a club, and it sort of irreparably damaged my hearing. And I went in in about 2006 uh, to get some of these sort of fancy um, molded ear defenders put in, because uh, quite a few of my friends had them working in that scene. And the woman insisted on doing a hearing test first, and when she was looking at the results, she said, oh, we don't normally see this level of hearing loss in people under 40, and I was 25 at the time. So that was a bit of a blow. Um, but I ignored it, which is what everyone does when they find out they're going deaf. And it actually takes about 10 years on average to go from needing hearing aids to actually getting them, because there's a huge stigma surrounding them. Not, not cool, like uh, like uh, glasses, you know, Calvin Klein and stuff, they aren't designing hearing aids at the moment. Uh, so it took me a long time, and then eventually I, I did get some fitted a couple of years ago in 2012. And the it's a very strange experience because the, the loss of hearing is so gradual that your brain is very, very good at sort of compensating for that. And you don't notice it. And it wasn't until I lived with my girlfriend at the time that she would hear things, sort of a car alarm going up on our side, she say, that, that car alarm's really annoying me. And I say, well, what car alarm? I can't hear it. Um, and also the, the, the frequency loss isn't equal. So you tend to all kind of hearing loss, uh, well, depending, I can't say all of it, but a lot of hearing loss starts at the four kilohertz range, which is unfortunately the vocal range. So whilst traffic or, um, you know, computers or music and that kind of thing, sounds normal to me, that volume is normal, uh, the vocal frequencies are all very much diminished, and so it's very, very hard for me to pick out uh, conversations against background noise. If I go and see a movie, for example, I have no hope of actually understanding what anyone is saying in that movie, because they're all full of rumbles and explosions and everything else like that. I like seeing foreign movies, uh, because they've got subtitles, so that's really great for me. I see a lot of, uh, I watch a lot of foreign films. And so I got these things fitted eventually, and Training the brain to to kind of get back into that swing of things is a very unusual experience. I started to hear sounds that I hadn't been able to hear for a long time, and they my brain didn't really know what to make of them, and so it became this kind of strange white noise uh, where I knew I was hearing something, but I didn't really understand what I was hearing. Uh, and eventually, you get used to that. Your brain does retrain itself. Um, but the other interesting thing was that. Hearing aids have a huge amount of processing that goes on in them, so they're not just sort of like ear trumpets where everything gets amplified equally. They have imperfect microphones, and those capture the environment around them, and then there's a, a heck ton of processing that goes on inside the hearing aid, and then they output something in a very select kind of amplification, select frequencies of what they think you ought to be able to hear. So they're trying to give you uh, they're kind of, they're trying to make your hearing as it was, but they're also sort of making their own interpretations about what is useful sound and what is noise. And so it's actually quite a coloured picture, quite a, an interpretation. And this really got me thinking, because if I'm going to have to listen to an interpretation, then uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be one based in reality. And then, of course, the other part of it is the big aesthetics. And so, uh, and the same sort of feeling as Veronica did, where you first get these fitted, and my first ones were over the ears, so they were sort of slightly visible, not particularly visible, uh, but they come in this hideous beige colour, and that's the only colour you're allowed to have. Uh, and someone said to me, it's like they've gotten all of the skin tones of everyone in the entire world and mixed them all together, and that's what they've got, that's the kind of colour you have to go with. Um, so that was kind of unfortunate as well. And so there's, those are the two aspects for me. How can I change the appearance of them, and how can I change the, uh, the underlying code? And so I made this documentary with the BBC with Radio 4 called Hack My Hearing, examining this kind of angle. And originally we wanted to say that uh, there was this great 
sort of unseen epidemic of deafness sweeping the nation's youth because we're all going to clubs every weekend and ruining our hearing. Uh, we did the research, that turns out not to be true. It's just that I've got really bad genetics, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what we did do, and, and especially through meeting Neil and then interviewing him on throughout the show, was to expand upon this idea of how far can we push us, how far can we apply our hearing. And so the thing that I'm working on at the moment <coughs> with some funding from Nesta is to shift my hearing or to enhance my hearing so that I am able to hear Wi-Fi. And there's sort of uh, specific reasons for this. So some of you may recognize this. This is a piece of artwork by a guy called Timo Arnold, who... Uh, visualized Wi-Fi, and it was an incredibly popular uh, piece of artwork, and uh, as you're seeing there, these LEDs sort of represent the strength of Wi-Fi as someone walks through the environment, and they're created by, I have got, I've got the picture, no, I haven't got the picture of person doing it, so they're created by someone literally holding a huge big stick with some LEDs on it, uh, and a Wi-Fi receiver, and walking through with a uh, long exposure uh, set up on the camera, um, and this really taps into an idea about making invisible architectures visible. And he's expanded upon this idea here, which is, again, looking at uh, Wi-Fi, sources of Wi-Fi within the environment. And this is something that we rely upon absolutely every day. Like everyone here has a phone in their pocket. Uh, these devices rely upon a network, and we, we call it a network and call it a Wi-Fi. We don't really understand it. We don't really understand where it is. Uh, how many there are, when you walked here or you've got the tube here from wherever your, your homes were, you have no idea how many different Wi-Fi fields you walked through when you went from one base station to another. So it's really, really interesting me, to me that that kind of architecture, this essential architecture of our world is not apparent, is not visible. And again, other artists have explored this. This is a, a drone shadow by James Bridal. Again, looking at these invisible systems, in this case, the uh, drone warfare, where these drones are at 40,000 feet and will bomb you in the blink of the eye before you even notice they're there. And it was a way of making them visible by painting the outline of particular drones on the ground. And James Bridal also did another project called Occupy the Cloud. Um, so these three symbols there is the standard symbol for the Occupy movement and then the symbol for the internet and the symbol for the cloud. Um, and this is, again, this idea of making these invisible, uh, these visible architectures real. And so at the moment I'm working with a guy called uh, Dan, Daniel Jones, he's a sound artist, and we're working on a way to tie my hearing aids to uh, an iPhone or you know, a, a smartphone. And the glorious thing is that now, right now we're on this cusp of getting networked hearing aids. And so the hearing aids can be, have a radio loop attached to them or can... Even now, I think this, this week, ReSound launched their Bluetooth hearing aids. These can connect directly to a smartphone. And to me, that's really exciting because it means that through my ears, I am connected to the entire internet. And I have to wear these things all day, every day anyway. So I have my phone with me all day, every day. So why not use that as a portal for listening to information about my environment? And we've chosen, I chose Wi-Fi here because it's something that I think everyone in the audience kind of understands why it would be um, useful and why it would be around you, but really there's no end to the amount of information that I can stream directly to my ears. And in, a, in the future, as we move forward, we have this idea of the Internet of Things and everything has a sensor in there and it's generating this endless amount of data. We haven't really cottoned on to how we're going to actually make sense of all of that data. And for something like a, an email, it's a very discreet piece of information. Your phone rings, you get it, you look at it, you read the email, and then you have that information in your head, and that's, that's it done. Then you can put your phone away. And there is different kinds of information. It's like continuous information doesn't work that way. And so this is why your phone rings. Because if you actually had to look at your phone to know when someone calling you, you'd have to stare at your phone all day, you know, just in case someone might call you. And the idea of hearing is a really, really great platform for these continuous forms of data. It's the same if you were to listen to a piece of music, you can hear music and you can hear all of the different instruments that are going on at one time. You can hear changes in pitch and tempo, in the mood, all of these qualities. Uh, those are apparent to you, but if you try to read sheet music, there is no way that anyone here could read all of the sheet music for every instrument in an orchestra at normal speed and try and get an, imp you know, get an impression of that, that, that data, the data that's contained within them. So hearing is a really fantastic platform for tapping into these sort of continuous data feeds, and one of which would be the Wi-Fi environment around me. 
Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've sort of come to the same uh, same idea as Veronica here, that these this is really a platform, this is an enhancement, this is an opportunity to do things that other people can do. None of you here have a light up leg with a secret compartment in it. That's really awesome. Uh, and in the same way, I'm hoping that to demonstrate that with hearing loss, I'm not going to have to see it as hearing loss in the future. In a sense, I'm going to see it as an augment um, that will continue to get better. As Neil said, um, the rest of us will, you know, the bits will all decay, but uh, our sort of cybernetic implants and Veronica's and the bionic hand here will continue to get better throughout our lives. It'll be the one bit of us that always gets better and better. So it's an exciting future for me. Thank you very much. So one time we just get mic'd up. Why Wi-Fi? Why Wi-Fi? Um, I think uh, I should explain a little more about it. Um, the idea is not to simply be sensitive to it in the sense of, oh, look, there's some free, free Wi-Fi over there and a head over there. Uh, it's more to have it like traffic noise, to be aware of this invisible environment. And I think it's important because we are surrounded day to day with this invisible architectures, whether it's the algorithms that decide which adverts are served to us, or it's policing kind of procedures that decide you might be a terrorist because you bought the three different items which only terrorists ever buy, you know, in, in a single day. And if you don't, if you're not aware of those systems, if you are unable to perceive those systems, then they will be used to control you. So it's very important to. Uh, readdress that balance to become more aware of the environment around us. Then is the is it going to be part of your hearing, or is it going to be an extra sense? Because I know, in perhaps after Frank's um, responded, you could tell us a little bit more about. It's not really hearing; it's an entirely new sense. It's bone conduction, although it acts like hearing in the organ means. Uh, in in my context, it's. That's a tricky question, uh, because my hearing aids, effectively, without them, I can't normally function. So anything that comes through them is hearing. Uh, it's, I would stick on one side. I'd say it's still hearing. It's using hearing as a platform for taking in data that you otherwise normally wouldn't be perceptive to. Neil, if you mind, explain to the audience the, the process, because we sat down um, a couple of months ago now and tried to work out whether it was a hearing process or is it an entirely different sense because it's a it's a quasi visual hearing if that's yeah right. well i so separate bone, bone conduction hearing is to me feels different from air conduction and i yeah to me bone conduction is visual sounds and air conduction is audio sounds and there is a difference um, but i can't really I, it's difficult for me to describe the difference i don't know how to it's like the for you to describe what a color looks like, to me it's difficult to describe how it feels to hear through bone conducting. It's different, I don't know, it's... Um... One, of the, one, of the suggestions, <laughs> one, of the, one of the suggestions you gave was this, the antenna, you've open sourced the entire technology so anyone can experience what you are experiencing. You have some advice, is that right? Um, sorry, again. So you've open sourced the technology. Oh, yeah, so anyone could create this. Uh, yeah, it's all online, so anyone that wants to create an antenna, they can uh, search online and they can create it. Uh, it's all open source. Yeah. 